Hi everyone, my name is Sylvia. Thank you so much for clicking on this video. I am here with another unsolved true crime case for you guys. If you haven't already, please hit that subscribe button down below if you'd like to see more true crime videos. Today I'm talking about the case of Hang Lee. She was a first generation Laos teenage girl who went missing in St. Paul, Minnesota in the 90s. Her parents don't speak very much English and they had a lot of trouble getting coverage for her case initially. So I am here to tell her story in hopes that you know, what happened to her doesn't happen to somebody else and to raise more awareness for a creepy individual who is currently out walking free in St. Paul, Minnesota. Hang was last seen on January 12th, 1993, and the Minnesota police suspect foul play in her disappearance. And this is actually one of the oldest unsolved cases in Minnesota history. So I'm sickened yet curious. Let's get into it. Hang Lee was a 17-year-old girl at the time of her disappearance. She stood at 5 feet tall and weighed less than 100 pounds. And this is actually, I think, partially because she was born in a Hmong refugee camp in Laos. And her parents later immigrated to the United States for a better life, which unfortunately... As you can see from her appearance, she was kind of a punk rock chick. She really liked metal music and she had a pretty edgy hairstyle. She liked to experiment with her hair. She was like a lot of teenagers as they get older and start wanting to get more independence from their parents and they start experimenting with who they are. Don't let Hang's appearance make you think that she was a rebellious or difficult child because she was very devoted to her family. In fact, she even worked at a Chinese restaurant named Wong Cafe to help pay the bills. Her parents actually described her as sweet and naive, and she loved to read and write, and she was at the top of her class. She planned on going to the University of Minnesota the following year after she had graduated. This restaurant, Wong Cafe, you know, gave her some extra cash, but she was paid minimum wage, and it really just wasn't doing it for her. So she started looking for other jobs. On the evening of January 12th, 1993, it seemed like she had found just that. Shortly after 6 p.m., she left her St. Paul home with her friend Nikki Lee. They have the same last name, but they're not related. Nikki had a potential job interview for her, so Hang called into Wong Cafe and told them that she wasn't coming in because she was going to a job interview. And this actually kind of fits with the naive thing because I would never call my current employer and tell them that I was going to a job interview for another job. Um, but anyway, in addition to telling her employer where she was going, she told her brother that she was heading off to a job interview. And as she was walking out the door, she turned to her 15-year-old brother Kua and said something very ominous. She said, quote, if I don't come back, come looking for me. And Hang was right. She never returned back from this job interview. And the crazy thing is, this job interview wasn't some sort of secret, anonymous, sort of Craigslist listing. It was actually with her friend Nikki's boss. Mark Wallace owned a painting and carpentry business on the east side of Minnesota, and Nikki worked there as a receptionist. Hang liked the idea of working with someone her age, and Mark's business was supposed to be paying her a few more dollars per hour, so I think she was also very intrigued by this. Driving away from her house, this is the last time that Hang was ever seen by anybody. Days went by after this job interview and her parents were wondering where she was. She hadn't called them, she hadn't written to them, nothing. Hang never returned home and she didn't even go by Wong Cafe to pick up her last paycheck. And sadly, her purse was still sitting on the kitchen table with her knife that she used for self-defense inside. Because her parents spoke very limited English, it was difficult for them to file a missing persons report. Her 15-year-old brother basically had to do everything uh, between translating what the police were saying to his parents and what his parents were saying back to the police, in addition to being interviewed because he was one of the last people to see Hang. When he was interviewed by the police, Kua told them about Hang's macabre last words, if I don't come back, come looking for me. You know, this kind of indicates that Hang was maybe getting a little suspicious or nervous about this job interview. Um, Kua also says that Hang kind of suspected that Nikki wasn't the best friend in the world, and he really pressed the police on the fact that he didn't believe that Nikki was who she said she was. 
So the police interview Nikki several times and their reports show that she changed her story numerous times. First, she said that Hang dipped out of the job interview and then left with several men to run away. And then when she was interviewed a few months later, she had a different story. She admitted that she lied about the first story and she said that her employer, Mark Wallace, told her to lie. So Nikki sits down and she tells them that she is going to tell them the truth this time. And she tells them about how one day her boss, Mark Wallace, asked her if she had any friends who were looking for employment. This immediately struck Nikki as odd because their store wasn't busy at all. They didn't need another employee when Nikki was sitting around most days with nothing to do. She goes into detail about some shady events that occurred at Mark's business. Um, there were hardly ever any customers or clients, but young men would often come by and go into Mark's office with him and the door was always locked behind them. Mark would also ask Nikki if she was interested in modeling and he said that he had a model scout as a friend. He even took Polaroids of Nikki one day to show to this modeling scout even though nothing ever came of it. And despite all of this creepy behavior, Nikki still let Hang know about this job opening at Mark's company. She even drove Hang to the office where she introduced the two. In her police interrogation, Nikki said that after the interview, Mark offered to drive both of them home, which doesn't really make sense because it sounds like she drove her own car to the interview, so why would she take a ride home if her car was there? Nikki and Hang supposedly got into Mark's white pickup truck, and he drives them part of the way before transferring them into a 1998 silver Chevy Cavalier, and then drives them the rest of the way to Nikki's place. So for some reason, he changed cars. And so they're driving to Nikki's place. Nikki's in the uh, passenger seat and then Hang is sitting in the back. Nikki is dropped off safe and sound and then Hang gets from the back seat of this silver Chevy Cavalier and then goes to sit in the front with Mark. And this is the last time that she ever saw Hang. Nikki lawyered up soon after this and stopped speaking. Nikki lawyered up soon after this and stopped speaking to the police. Now, about this Mark Wallace character, he is a total creep, and in 1987, he essayed two girls and served prison time for this in the neighboring county to St. Paul. And to make this more disturbing, one of these attacks was on a 16-year-old girl who he told he had a job offer for. And at this supposed job interview, he held a knife to her neck and covered her eyes and threatened to kill her if she told anybody what he was doing. In order to catch Mark for this 1987 attack, the police actually had a female officer pose as a teenage girl and Mark approached her with a similar offer. He said that he had a potential job for her and that she should come in for an interview sometime. So this dude clearly has an MO. Even though this is really creepy and shows that he's capable of planning, Mark served just under three years for this. And if that's not frustrating enough, his probation ended one week before Hang's supposed job interview. The police obviously want to interview this man and they get him into the station where he tells them that the interview went completely normal and he drove both girls home. He dropped Nikki off in front of her house and then he dropped hang off at the intersection of Rice Street and Wheelock Parkway, which is right next to where Wong Cafe was. Then, like Nikki, Mark hires a lawyer and stops cooperating with the investigation. Hang's case goes cold until 16 years later, almost her entire lifetime later, the police get a break. So this same guy, Mark Wallace, couldn't pay his bills and his house is foreclosed on. So the police go to the bank and they give them permission to search it. The police used cadaver dogs to search Mark's house and they were all drawn to the garage. In particular, they were drawn to this area in the back that was encased in concrete. The police drilled holes in this concrete and the dogs were brought back to sniff again. Sadly, once these holes were drilled, they were less interested and they did not react as strongly as the police thought. The police said that they did not have enough reason to excavate this garage flooring. 
In August 2016, Mark Wallace fled a traffic stop and the police began tracking him. They followed him to his motel room where they busted down the door to find him with a kidnapped 20 year old woman who was being held there against her will. Uh, this girl was described as being frozen in fear and she wished to remain anonymous throughout the rest of the investigation. However, she did say that she had information that could help solve the case of Hang Lee. This 20 year old woman said that she met Mark's daughter in high school and they became friends and then he offered her a place to stay because she was out of money and down on her luck. She did some housework for Mark and then one day he attacked her and held her there against her will. She had clear bruising all over her and she was emaciated, indicating that she was not fed while she was being held captive by Mark. Mark was charged with felony kidnapping, stalking, and meth possession, which I think you can kind of tell from his mugshot. And for some reason he wasn't charged with any sort of sex offenses, even though, um, I don't know, that's kind of what I assumed when I first read this story, but they don't mention it anywhere. Even though he had ties to Hang Lee's unsolved disappearance, it's almost like the police forgot, and this total creep with a history of violence against women is sentenced to only 54 months in prison. This woman does make a point to speak to the police about Mark's past and the fact that she thought that he was Hang's murderer. She told the police that she confronted Mark about Hangley's disappearance, and he told her that she entered his office and never came out. He, he also threatened to kill her if she did anything to fight against him, and he said that he would do to her what he did to Hang. Mark reportedly told her that he knew how to get rid of blood evidence, and he knew how to cut through bone. So these are two different police departments and the police passed this case on to the St. Paul department. However, it doesn't seem like they even took this woman's story seriously because there was no movement on Hank's case. In August 2019, a court in Hanoga County committed Mark to a treatment center for, I guess, violent individuals. They said that Mark exhibited traits of a psychopath, which is not surprising to me, and they held him in this treatment center. While he was there, he poured boiling water on the face of one of the other inmates, and this earned him another 30 weeks in that treatment center. Um, I totally agree with the fact that Mark might be a psychopath. He seems like he is a very calculated person um, with the whole switching cars, with the fact that he must have dismembered her to make it easier to dispose of her body. And Hang's body still hasn't been located. And it's almost like the police don't even care about this anymore, which like, I don't know, I guess I get it in a way because you can't really sentence somebody without there being a body. It happens sometimes, but it's really hard to get a conviction for a no body murder case. But it's just terrifying because Mark Wallace is clearly a dangerous person and he was released from this treatment center after he served his time. So um, based on what I've read on the internet, Mark Wallace is walking around free. He still won't say anything about Hang's disappearance or where her body might be located. And this is especially heartbreaking because in Hmong culture, somebody needs to be cremated so that their spirit can be released and then they can pass on to the next life where they're reincarnated. And because her parents don't have her body, they can't fully carry out this ceremony. They were really holding on to hope that Mark would give up the location of Hang's body, but in 2013, her father's dying wish was actually for them to hold the ceremony absent of a body. Hang's father passed away in 2013, leaving her mother and her brother to carry out this makeshift ceremony. Since there was no body to burn, they could just kind of remember their memories about Hang and, you know, just try to raise more awareness for her case because the St. Paul police have really made no progress in locating her remains. This case is so frustrating because it's one of those cases where it's pretty clear what happened, but the killer covered up their tracks so well that they're able to evade the law. It actually kind of reminds me of the Colleen Wood case, which was one of the first cases I covered where her... 
This actually reminds me of the Colleen Wood case, which is one of the cases I first covered where her boyfriend clearly murdered her and dumped her at sea. She's never been seen again. She was last seen on a boat with him and he had a violent streak and he actually um, was previously in jail for attempted murder. But Mark Wallace had a clear history of hurting women and he practically confessed to killing Hang. However, it does seem like finding her body will be difficult, especially if it's in pieces. But I still want them to dig up that garage flooring. Like if she was in pieces, then that would make sense that like it would be harder to detect her underneath the concrete. I'm wondering if there are like other victims too, because like this guy seems to be very cold and calculated. And then another question about all of this is how involved her friend was because police records show that Hang didn't fully trust Nikki and she clearly knew that her boss was a creep. So why are you setting your friend up to be alone in his office with him? I don't know. I mean, hindsight is 2020. Like in a lot of these cases, I feel like the families and friends get a lot of hate for like not acting with more caution, but obviously like they didn't think that something like this would happen. But I don't know. It's just so weird that Nikki would know that her boss was a creep. There was that whole modeling thing. There was the men going into his office. Um, so why would you let your teenage friend meet up with him? But yes, anybody with information that can lead to the recovery of Hing's remains is encouraged to contact the St. Paul Police Department. I will put that contact information below. But yeah, that is basically all I have about this case. It's still unsolved, but it kind of sounds like there is an answer. There's just not enough evidence to prove that answer. I hope you enjoyed this video about the disappearance of Hang Lee. Please remember to like and subscribe if you enjoyed it. I would love to see you next week for the next one. Thank you so much. I hope you have a great day and stay safe.